We're going to finish Habakkuk today, just these three little weeks in a short little uh, book of the prophet Habakkuk. We'll be looking at his prayer to close the chapter, and we'll talk a little bit about where he has been and what we've been up to after I read this. So Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One, from Mount Paran, Salah. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan and distressed the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. Salah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot, Salah. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a couple of housekeeping matters first. When I'm reading a psalm and it says Salah, I never say Salah. And there's a reason for it. It's in the Hebrew. It's in your Bibles almost always. The reason for it is nobody knows what it means. We have no idea what the word means. We have no idea why it's there, why it is where it is. And it comes up three times in this psalm. It's not just a prayer. It's really a psalm. But because we're not in the psalms, and I wanted you to get the feel that this is not the way a prophet would normally end his book. I wanted to read it. We can't tell whether it's a musical note, whether it's a call for a refrain or something else, but it doesn't make sense to us. So nobody's been able to come up with a good description. I'm so hoping you're worrying about on Shigianoth and what Shigianoth is and how we're going to play it or sing it or pray it on Shigianoth. We don't know that either. It comes up in a couple of psalms. Uh, Psalm 7 is the first one, but it's there. It looks like it's an instrument on Shigion. So maybe these are the instruments they're playing, but we don't know. But the main thing you need to recognize from this, from the inscription, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, to the postscript almost for the director of music on my stringed instruments is... That Habakkuk, having demanded an answer from God, having been willing to go toe-to-toe with God, confronting God on the situation in which he found himself, and then not particularly liking God's solution to that situation, when he finishes his interactions with God, when he is ready to finish writing this book, he prays a psalm. I don't know what prayers you normally read, whether you actually read a lot of other people's prayers. The great value in reading other people's prayers is that we discover things about God that we wouldn't necessarily pray or think about ourselves, which is why the Psalms have been the prayer book of the church since before we were a church. God's people, uh, the Israelites, uh, the Jews, from long before there was a church, that was their prayer book, and it gives us words to pray. Sometimes our God, or well, more than that, our prayers are limited by the God that we know in our own prayers and by our own study, uh, by our own reading, by our own thinking. And Habakkuk introduces us to a God that's very different than the God most of us pray to. And we'll talk about that in a moment. 
But where do we leave Habakkuk? As I said, he was standing on the rampart, standing on the wall, saying, I'm going to wait and see what answer God's going to give me for my complaint. What's going to happen now that I've told God this isn't right? What's not right? The people of God, the community in which he's living, are treating each other terribly. There's injustice, uh, there is corruption and bribery, and Habakkuk calls out to God and says, do you see what's going on here? Aren't you going to do something? And God says, as a matter of fact, I am going to do something, but you're not going to like it. I'm going to bring in this wicked, evil, pagan, foreign nation, the terrible Babylonians. Everyone's afraid of them. And they're going to be the instruments of judgment on my people. And Habakkuk does not run cowering to his room. Instead, he stands up even straighter and says, I don't think this is right. This can't be what you mean. You don't really want to send those Babylonians on your righteous people, whom he just said weren't acting in a righteous manner. And God gives a long reply. That's what we looked at last week. That's chapter 2. God's, most of chapter 2 is God's answer to Habakkuk. And now, Habakkuk, having just said, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And it's an awed reverence. Then he prays. Then he prays a psalm. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. This sort of prayer is sometimes a request, sometimes a lament. It's not this time. Um, it's praising God, but it also is calling out for God to act. And the first thing that Habakkuk brings up in his prayer is a call to remember. I think that's one of the most important things we as the people of God do together and for one another. We are called to remind one another of what God has done. If we are not able to see God at work in our lives, we need people around us who say, you remember what God did when we were so worried about this. God acted in this great way. You remember we didn't see any way out and now God has made a way out and things are different. Sometimes we need people who have spent their lives studying scripture, uh, ages and decades of studying scripture so they can say, you remember long ago this God whom we worship did amazing things, did great things, as he told Moses in Exodus, as Joe just read. I'm going to do amazing things, awesome things, things that have never been done before. We need people to remind us this is the God we worship and the God we serve and the God we pray to and the God we trust in, God who's done amazing things in the past. Because if we remember what God has done in the past, we might be able to trust in who God is in the present and put our trust in the promises God has made for the future. It's one of the major calls, one of the major roles, one of the major jobs we have as the people of God to remind one another, this is God, this is what he has done, this is what he's doing now, even though we may not always be able to see it, and this is what he's promised to do in the future. So Habakkuk remembers, Lord, I have heard of your fame, I stand in awe of your deeds. I remember what you've done, O Lord. He remembers for himself... Then he does an interesting little twist. He calls on God to remember. God who can't forget, but he's not the first, nor will he be the last, to remind God of something. Remind God of his nature, of his character, of his attributes. Moses does this all the time, and you think that Moses would be zapped for it. I mean, Moses could never have survived if God were a really vengeful God. Because Moses is always saying, Lord, remember, this is what you said. Eventually that gets annoying, you know. Remember, this is what you said. Anyone who's a parent may have been annoyed by that. Remember that you said that. I didn't remember that I said that. Now I wish I hadn't said it the first time. What Moses did, what other prophets did, what Habakkuk does is, Lord, remember. Lord, in your wrath, in your judgment, in the justice which is about to be meted out upon your people, he he accepts that. He accepts that God is going to act in a way that is going to bring his wrath to bear on this corruption and perversion of justice and all these terrible situations. But in your wrath, remember mercy. God himself says, in the end, mercy overcomes wrath. And so God, who is just, God who always does what is right, God who is willing to tell us when what we have done or what the whole human race has done deserves absolute wrath and judgment and anger of God, in the end does remember mercy in ways that are crazy and unexpected. Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk calls us also to remember that this is the God we serve and the God we pray to, the God we trust in, a God who has done great things and a God who does remember his mercy even in the midst of wrath. But what kind of God do we pray to? See, the problem for us, and again, if we don't read other people's prayers, is that we can end up making a very, very small God. I mean, a nice God, don't get me wrong, a God of good intentions, a God who really wishes things were going differently for you and for me, a God who really has a different plan for this world that just, you know, things aren't going the way that we planned. And we all find ourselves in that situation a lot, I think, whether we recognize it or not. We will pray a prayer that is to a God who is not really able to do what we ask him to do. Lord, if you're able, 
Somebody said that to Jesus once, and he said, I am able. If you're able, if you think you just, by the way, normally wouldn't bother you, but things aren't really going so well right now. So if you could just, you know, do a little something, make it a little bit better. That is not the God Habakkuk is praying to. He is praying to a God who is so far beyond our imagination, so far beyond our expectations, that he trusts that this God can do great things. Not a God of good intentions, but a God of glory. God came. That means he shows up. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, and his glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. You remember when Joe was reading about Moses having to go back up the mountain to get the second copy of the Ten Commandments, not the sequel, but another copy, which you broke, God told Moses. Moses has to go up there. What does he tell the people? I don't want anyone else on this mountain. I don't want any animals at the foot of the mountain. I don't want anyone coming close to this mountain, which is perfectly fine with the people. Because when God shows up on this mountain, a cloud comes down. There are earthquakes. There are trumpet blasts. The mountain looks like it's on fire. And the people said, Moses, you just go right on up there. And whatever God says, we'll do it. But we're not going to go up with you. Looks far too frightening. This is the God Habakkuk's praying to. His glory covers the heavens. His praise fills the earth. His splendors like the sunrise and rays flash from his hand where his power was hidden. This is a glorious, majestic, mighty God that Habakkuk is praying to. He says this strange thing. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. This is an accompaniment uh, idea. But it also is significant because if we have his glory coming down, like on Mount Sinai when he's delivering the Ten Commandments, plague and pestilence remind us of when the people were enslaved in Egypt. And the way that they got out of their enslavement is that God sent plagues and pestilence upon the Egyptians until Pharaoh finally said, fine, get out of here. This is part of what is informing Habakkuk's prayer. He is steeped in scripture. He understands God's workings in the past and they are flowing out of him as a wonderful prayer. The other weird thing that you need to know though, plague and pestilence, one went before him, one followed his steps. The language he's using are like royal attendants. So um, like the president has the security council and advisors and it's always strange to me to hear people's job descriptions. I don't always know what people do in the White House. Um, but you know, when they have a security advisor, I can only imagine that they come and say, well, by the way, we might want to think about this but in a kingdom with an emperor or a powerful leader you have attendants and they are there both to give advice but also to show that this is a great powerful leader what are god's attendants in habakkuk's envisioning envisioning plague and pestilence are his servants are his attendants are his instruments he is more powerful than the things that the people feared most when he stands up the earth shakes he looks and the nations tremble, the mountains crumble, and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are beyond time, eternal, forever lasting. God shows up and all of creation reacts. The mountains fall down and the nations tremble and the earth shakes and glory is shining everywhere. And that's the God Habakkuk is praying to here. This is the God he says, I need to come in and act in this situation. All the enemies of God, the tents of Kushan, the dwellings of Midian, ancient enemies of the people of Israel, they are in anguish and distress because God has shown up. God appears and shows up and all creation acknowledges him. This is a bit of a scary image of God, by the way. Again, why it's helpful sometimes, because we wouldn't necessarily pray a prayer to a really scary God, but Habakkuk does it for good reason. He says, were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Were you upset with the seas? What was wrong with all the waters that you came crashing against them? You raged against them in your horses and chariots, and you uncovered your bow, and you had all these arrows. You split the earth. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep, that's the ocean, roared and lifted its waves on high. And God is in control of them as well. God shows up and all of his enemies flee before him. God shows up not as the all-glorious, majestic, mighty creator God. He is that still. But in this image, he's actually switched just a little bit. This image is of God as divine warrior. This is God going out to battle. Sun and moon stand still before him. At the glint of your flying arrows, the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. And that's a scary God. And that's not a God we normally pray to. Why is he so angry? Why is his wrath coming? What is going on here? His wrath is coming. In his anger he threshes the nations because his people are in danger. 
In this particular historical situation, they're in danger because they kept turning away from God. And God said, you keep doing that and you're going to be overthrown by your neighbors and you're going to go off into exile. And the people said, yeah, yeah. And they kept doing their own thing. And so finally, God's going to send the army of Babylon and take them off into exile. But what's the promise made all the way back in Deuteronomy? If you go off into exile, I will not leave you there, but I will bring you back. In this case, in wrath, you strode through the earth and in anger, you thresh the nations because his people are threatened by this nation that he's sending as an instrument of judgment. Babylon is threatening his people, and he's coming in anger and might to save them. You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. You came out to deliver and to save. God in battle to protect his people from whatever is threatening them. God shows up, and all opposition flees before him. This is the God Habakkuk's praying to. Creator of all things, all glorious, all mighty, all majestic, and now divine warrior with all power at his disposal to save his people. For them, for Habakkuk, the threat is very real. It is very tangible and it will be coming very soon. It's an army coming from this horrible nation of Babylon. They know a lot about what these people do when they conquer uh, neighboring nations. It is not a pretty sight and they are terrified. But the idea, I think, for us is that when God's people are threatened, God comes in power to save. So whatever threatens you, whatever threatens me, whether it be fear or loss or disease or dying or disappointment and broken hearts, whatever is opposed to God's working in this world, whatever is opposed to God's making this world work the way that it's supposed to work, God comes and shows up. And this is the God they have to deal with, a God with all power and a God who comes in wrath and anger because his people are in trouble. He defeats the enemy. He crushes the leader of the land of wickedness. He tramples the sea. He churns the great waters. You came out to deliver your people and to save your anointed one. This is Habakkuk's prayer. I need a God who is so powerful and so mighty and so willing to act on behalf of his chosen ones that he will come and show up in battle and win the battle. And he does. In wrath, remember mercy. You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. It's not where I'm going to end, but it may be the most important thing I say. So, in wrath, remember mercy. Something amazing happened on the cross so very long ago. God's wrath comes down on earth, on all the sins of all humanity, yours and mine and everyone before us, everyone coming after us. And his wrath is located on the cross. And Jesus takes God's wrath for us. And then... Saves his anointed one. Anointed one means Messiah, means Christ. Raises him again from the dead so that sin and death and fear and loss and disease and dying and disappointment, all those have been conquered through Jesus Christ. In his wrath, he remembered mercy. He was merciful to us by saving us through Jesus Christ. And so the God of glory who created all things comes in battle. And what is he fighting? Everything that is most threatening to us, everything that is most dangerous to us, everything uh, that is trying to destroy us. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. And Habakkuk sees this vision of God both in glory and also in awesome might and power coming uh, to wage battle against sin and death, and it's terrifying. I heard and my heart pounded and my lips quivered and I could hardly stand up. My legs were shaking so badly. Yet, he says, I will wait. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. It's an important move for Habakkuk. He doesn't like the fact that there is injustice and mistreatment among the people of God and the community of faith. People are not acting as God's own children. But when God says, I got a solution for that, Habakkuk is terrified by that. Babylon, really, that can't be. At the end of this book and towards the end of the prayer, he finally decides what God is going to do is going to be right and just. And I will wait patiently because though it looks like we're all going to die, Yet the righteous will live by faith. Though it looks like everything's just going to collapse around us, I will wait for the day of calamity to come on God's enemies. In his case, Babylon. In our case, sin and death. I will wait patiently for the victory. 
So Habakkuk says, we've got to remember, we got to remember who God is, what he's done in the past, that he is still at work in the present, even though it may not look like it, and what he's going to do in the future based on his promises. And we have to remember that. We have to acknowledge that the God we're praying to and the God we're leaning on and trusting in is this all-glorious, holy, majestic, mighty God who also has all power to defeat all of our enemies and all of his. And that's great and good, and that'd be a fine place to stop. But that's not where Habakkuk stops, and that's not where I'm going to, because here is the problem for us nowadays. The reason that we pray to the God of good intentions, small though that God may be, is because there are a lot of times where it looks like God is not coming in power to save me. God is not coming and taking away this disease or healing this relationship or taking away my fear and my anxiety. God doesn't seem really to be paying attention to me, which is the reason we need one another to remind ourselves that God is still at work. But here's where Habakkuk finds himself, finding out a lot more about God than he anticipated, understanding God a lot better than he had ever really maybe wanted to. Here is what he says. Essentially, no matter what, no matter what, even if the fig tree doesn't bud, so there will be no fruit, even if there are no grapes on the vines for us to eat or to make into wine, even if the olive crop fails, the fields produce no food, even if everything seems to be going to pot, there is no hope here. There are no sheep in the pens. There are no cattle in the stalls. It looks as if God is not at work, will not come to save, will not deliver. How are we going to go on? There seems to be no future. No matter what, Habakkuk says, I will rejoice in the Lord. No matter what. Whether it looks bad or looks great. Whether it looks like the prognosis is going to be a good one or a frightening one, whether we're waiting to hear the results or whether we're waiting to see if somebody's going to respond to us, are we going to be turned away or finally accepted, whatever it may be, no matter what, Habakkuk says, I'm trusting in this God, all glorious, creator of all, almighty and powerful. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful. In God, my Savior, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to go on the heights, leaping like a deer, knowing that there are going to be some tough times ahead, terrifying times ahead, knowing that things aren't going exactly the way that he would like. Habakkuk says, no matter what, this is the God I pray to. This is the God I trust in. This is the God who is actually working all things together for good, whether it looks like it or not. This is the God who has all power and is all love to come and save you and me. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, of course, in Jesus Christ, you have delivered us and saved us. You have taken away our sin by his sacrifice in our place. You have opened the way to new life, eternal life, through his glorious resurrection. And you call us to be people of the resurrection here and now. But when it is difficult to trust, when it is difficult to believe, when it is difficult to pray to a mighty and powerful God, help us to remember what you have done and help us to remember your promises to us that you will save, you will deliver. And death and dying and disease do not have the last word, but the last word is your yes.